Um, okay. Okay. Let me just say this. Dougie has shared this out in the lobby here just a minute ago. It really is so appropriate and pertinent to what we'll be talking about. So I would ask you to do it. I have a. I have some dreams. I can never remember them, or if I do, it's unrelated. Last night I had, I think, my first dream that God woke me up and gave me the what I read or what I saw, and it, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. But um, so I, in the dream there was this man, and he was married, and everybody, no, nobody ever met his bride. He um, would go to parties. He would go to to different places, he'd go to work, and everybody's like, well, you know, introduce us to your wife, and we want to see your wife. And it finally came out that he wasn't really married. And, um, and so then I woke up, and God said, there are a lot of people that think they're married to the bride, and they're really not. And, um, and so it kind of really shook me up a little bit of, okay, God, is that for me, or is that for somebody else? And, um, but, uh, you know, God, just let me know, you know, to just tell people, stop pretending and get serious and, um, you know, yeah. be committed to the bride. Yeah. Amen. yeah, you can just give that to you. Amen. Amen. Wow, what a timely uh, introduction to this message. So thank you, Doug, for getting that and, and for sharing that. Um, what I want to talk about uh, today, I'm going to have another prayer here in just a minute, but what I want to talk about today and uh, next week for sure, maybe th uh, maybe even one more week, because I think it's such an important topic uh, that um, that we really don't need to just like talk about it and move on. It's something that we really need to deal with as a fellowship. And for those that are watching online, it, I think you know around the world, whoever's watching, we need to deal with this. It's such a timely timely issue that we need to deal with. And so. Uh, the title of the series and the title of this message is Aligning Our Heart with the Bridegroom. Aligning Our Heart with the Bridegroom. Uh, and so we want to uh, talk about that uh, today. Uh, let me just have a prayer and then uh, I'll get into explaining what I mean by this. Father, we, we do I do thank you for the group that's here. That, and I know we are coming out of a Thanksgiving weekend, and there we are full of food and uh, been distracted from our spiritual walk, probably a lot of us. And so we do ask, Father, for focus, as Brian talked about and prayed about a few minutes ago. We ask for focus. We ask for the work of the Holy Spirit to be upon us, that you would give us real attention uh, and, and focus. Uh, we ask for that, that we would really take to heart what you are saying through this, I do ask that you take me out of the way uh, and that you speak whatever you want to speak in whatever way you want to do this in the mighty name of Jesus, that we might have our heart aligned, more fully aligned with you. That is our desire in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So again, the name of the message is Aligning Our Heart with the Bridegroom. And what I want to do in this first message is to kind of re revolve it around my recent encounter in the hospital and uh, diagnosis of having AFib and, and all of that, because I do believe that the Lord was speaking uh, to me in it, uh, but he was also speaking it as a prophetic experience that is for our church for sure and probably even beyond that. Uh, so anyway, that's going to be the theme of today's message is to draw uh, some things from that and what the Lord was speaking to me spiritually uh, about it. Let me, let me start uh, by reading uh, Michelle had a word uh, about it, and uh, I wanted to start by just reading that. Um, uh, you know, she had some introductory uh, things she said about being encouraged that, uh, about uh, God moving on me in the hospital, and so I do really thank everybody for their prayers about that. Um, but she said, Saturday morning, Donna requested prayers for you as well as detailing what was going on in the physical at the hospital. And when I began to pray, the revelation that was given was this. 
it, it is God's desire uh, for, our, for our heartbeat to be in rhythm with his heartbeat. Uh, in other words, in full alignment with his heartbeat. Uh, coming into alignment with his will, that the eyes of his heart will be the eyes of our heart. The eyes of his heart will be the eyes, eyes of our heart. That our hearts must be rhythmically in sync with his. And I'm going to insert where she said sync, aligned. Be rhythmically aligned with his. On Sunday after the service, we broke up into groups and prayed. And while praying, the revelation from Saturday morning came forth again and was further confirmed that as your heart will be restored back to rhythm through shock methods, uh, medically, hopefully I don't have to have a shock, but anyway, you know, some way, uh, it, uh, that medically, that he will do the same for us in the spiritual to get our hearts in rhythmic balance once again and through all of it will be out of his sincere love for us and the goodness of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord. Coming into oneness with him in every way. Oneness with him in every way. Blessings and continued prayers for divine healing. And that she signed it, Michelle. Uh, so anyway, thanks, Michelle, for that word. And it was a, a very, very uh, timely, uh, timely word. And so, you know, to be honest, when I was in the hospital, the prophetic significance of it was the, probably the least thing I had on my mind. I was just... Uh, Wanted to get in hook from like a hundred uh, IV cords and heart monitors and uh, not have to eat hospital food any, anymore. If there's any motivation to get you out of the hospital, eating, especially the cardiac diet, that's like, oh my goodness. Yeah, Howard can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Howard, I hope this is okay to share. Howard and I were talking when he was having his bypass surgery and he was in for a couple of weeks. I forgot exactly how long he was in there, but it was quite a while, and he was eating the old cardiac diet. Uh, and he said, yeah, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to McDonald's and get me a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was a little bit surprised when he said that, but after spending the weekend there in the hospital, I was thinking, yeah, I definitely could understand uh, after two weeks the, the McDonald's cheeseburger would uh, would be good. So. Uh, anyway, I was not thinking about the spiritual significance of it, but as I got home, and I'll share this in a minute, as I got home, uh, the Lord began to speak to me actually over the, the next week uh, what he was saying spiritually for me, uh, but also for us as a fellowship. And I really felt like I needed to share it with us as a church. And we were coming back from the beach. You know, we had our vacation that we had to shift because of the hurricane. And so we, we stopped for lunch, and we were following Brian and Angie back, and we stopped for lunch, and Brian uh, asked me if I would preach this Sunday. And, you know, I knew his motivation. He just didn't want to preach over a holiday weekend. You know, that was, uh, that was what his plan was. And, you know, I started to say, no, I don't want to do it, because, I mean, it's like you have to, you know, you had spent several hours to prepare the message over the weekend and all that, and I didn't really want to fool with it. Uh, to be honest, but the Lord, even while we were there at lunch, the Lord really put on my heart that uh, this message is so important and that I needed to say yes to it, and uh, it is definitely that, and so uh, I know we're distracted in a lot of ways, but I, I do want your real focus on this. Uh, okay, so aligning our hearts with the bridegroom. Um, let me just start, uh, uh, and again, I'm going to do two or three weeks on this, but uh, let me just set the context about bridal readiness. I, I mean, for most of us here, we're very aware of this, but I want to make sure uh, that we are. So if you look at, uh, I want to look at it first from uh, John's perspective or, or Christ's perspective in the book of Revelation. You know, and, and I think all, most of you know this, but when uh, in Revelation 19, 7 and 8, it says, when the bride has made herself ready, uh, and the bride has made herself ready, and she's put on wedding garments, and I'm just summarizing these verses. But when that happens, then the very next verse or a couple of verses later, Christ returns, and he returns with his bride and for his bride. And so the key, the trigger to the return of Christ is not how dark the anti Antichrist system gets, not how bad the world gets, even though it's getting very, very bad. Uh, it's not that, it's the bride being made ready. 
Uh, and so, again, using the theology of, uh, of Revelation, the, the, the key there for making herself ready, uh, John uses the term, or Jesus uses it, I guess, uh, uh, through John, uh, is overcoming. Revelation 2 and 3 talks about overcoming. Uh, Revelation 12 talks about overcoming. And so the bride who's made herself ready has overcome. Uh, it's not an automatic thing. Even though you read a lot of the commentaries, they say when you're born again, you're automatically the bride. But it's a lot more like what Doug's dream was. The bride has to make herself ready. Uh, and, and in Revelation, they use the idea of overcoming. Now, if you go back to look at Paul's theology, if you look at Paul's theology and uh, in his epistles, uh, he uses a different terminology, but it's the same concept. Uh, Ephesians 5, 27 says at the end of the age that Christ will present to himself a church in all of her glory. Uh, a glorious church will be presented uh, to Christ. Now that is in the context of marriage. It's in the context, he says it, isn't it, right in, Revel in uh, Ephesians 5. It's in the context of bridal of the bride. So the bride made ready will be presented in glory without spot, without wrinkle, to be holy and blameless, will be presented to Christ uh, at his second coming in that. Now, you and I are not glorious, uh, even though we would like to be. It's Christ is the only one who contains the glory. Uh, you know, radio, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 he is the radiance, the, the ra he radiates the glory of the Father. And so to be presented to Christ uh, in, in all of our glory, it's only Christ who is the glory. We are a vessel. We are merely a vessel for the glory of Christ to be presented. So that leads to a lot of, uh, a lot of the other things that Paul says in his, in his uh, epistles is that we have to die to sin. We have to die to self. And the more we are dead, I no longer live, but uh, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And in, in his, uh, again, in his epistles, he talks about unto fullness. Then the more that that happens, the more we are dead and the more Christ is alive. And, the glory, and as that transpires, the glory of Christ will fill us because we are being filled with him unto fullness from Paul's theology. Now, the reason I said all that is that uh, I want to make sure we understand that in this life, in this life, we are on a journey of readiness. A sanctification is another term that's used for that. That's our life. That's our life goal. What is your life purpose? Our life purpose is to be transformed and to be conformed into the image of Christ so that as a vessel, his glory can permeate through us and we can be presented as a glorious bride without spot, without wrinkle uh, when he comes. That's our goal. And I'm, that's the context of which I'm, ta I'm going to be talking about the, our heart. Uh, being so important and being in line, aligned with Christ if we're going to achieve this goal of the bride being made ready. Now, before I get into to that some more, I want to talk a little bit about I want to talk a little bit about the times in which we're uh, we're living. Actually, uh, let me before I do that, let me talk a little bit about the importance of the heart in readiness. Uh, we talked about the bride need to, for the bride to be made ready, and that's our life purpose. The heart is, is the focal point. The heart is the focal point of our pursuit of readiness. I want you to hear that. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Life springs forth from our heart. If our heart is focused on God, if our heart is in full alignment with God, then the life of Christ will spring forth from that. But if our heart is, is, is not towards God, uh, then, you know, we're, we're just doing what Jug said in his dream. The, we're, we're, fake, we're just not real. We're a pretender. Uh, you know, Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, 
uh, for, there's, for they shall see God. Matthew 15, 8 and 9, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me. So it, it's crucial that we have a heart for God, but even more than that, that we have a heart aligned with God. That, and I'm going to talk about that more in a few minutes. It's not enough, listen to me now, it's not enough to have a heart for God in terms of bridal readiness. That's a critical, that's essential, obviously. And I, and I believe if, I believe everybody in this room, everybody in our church has a heart for God. I'm, I'm not questioning that in any way. But what I want to take us is to a different level. I mean, not, not me. That's where God wants to take us all, to a different level. And that level is to not only have a heart for God, but to have a heart aligned with God, aligned with God, fully aligned with Christ. Uh, that's uh, where we're headed. Now, one more point before I share a little bit about my experience in the hospital. Uh, you know, it's uh, when we were uh, maybe more like John's age, John and Heather's age, uh, we would go to our family for our, my parents for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. And we would talk, Donna and I would, would always pray, Lord, we bind any discussion of Medicare, Social Security, <laughs> medicine. You know, what is that commercial progressive say? The, the progressive can't keep you from turning into your parents or whatever. And so here we are. I'm going to share my hospital experience in just a minute. <laughs> but it does have a significant, a spiritual significance. But let me, let me talk a little bit about the season we're in right now. Brian talked about it a minute ago. I want to talk about it too for a minute. We are in a season, and not just us, the global church is in a season of redemptive judgment, redemptive judgment right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've seen it with all the, so many of the ministry, big ministries are falling and beginning to fall and just being exposed with all sorts of issues that are not, uh, not Christ and not what God wants. Uh, you know, even a couple of individuals had, uh, you know, just medical issues when they were speaking, when they were preaching. And I, I saw a tweet uh, where uh, a man said that he was one, can't help but wonder if the Ananias and Sapphira uh, moment has come upon the church. And, uh, you know, it could be. But I, I, my feeling is it's not there yet because they died. Ananias and Sapphira died. I think what God's trying to do is get the attention of the church right now. So it's redemptive, but it's redemptive if, if we heed it. You know, we have to heed what God is saying in this hour. Uh, and so we can't just uh, say, okay, this happened and I'm going to ignore it and I'm going to keep going the way I've always gone. It, 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 heeding it means wake up to it and then bring change into our own lives based on what God is saying. So the redemptive judgments don't bring the change, but hopefully they'll wake us up to the need for change so that we can move into a period of asking God uh, to bring us change. And that's the season that the church is in right now. There's a lot of evil things going on in the world and all that as well. But what he's doing, he's bringing judgment to the house of God. Now, I believe that the judgment is going to move beyond that, maybe very quickly, uh, to the world. And there is some of that actually happening now. But what the, the main point for us is that he is that the church... God is judging the house of God, and he's judging uh, individuals within that house. Now, I want to say this uh, about my hospital uh, encounter and experience and all that. I believe that God was doing two things, it, that it was redemptive judgment for me. Uh, you know, when, uh, when God works in our lives like something like this, we can't just... Assume it's just for the church. Uh, my experience has been, and Doug, this would be for you too, I guess. When God gives us an encounter, a dream, a word, uh, a prophetic experience or whatever, almost always 
It's not just for other people. The reason you get it is because he wants to speak to you first and foremost, and then beyond that, to other people. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to realize that. And so I know what I encountered was, to me, uh, uh, it was to me first. He was trying to get my attention that he wants my heart more greatly aligned with his heart uh, than it is right now. So I hear him, uh, and I'm going to cry out for that to be true. But I believe it's beyond that right now that he's saying to us as a fellowship uh, that we need to, to hear my redemptive judgment that God brought into my life, that we need to hear it and not just ignore it. And not just say, okay, it's a message on Thanksgiving weekend. We need to hear it and we need to ask God to get our heart uh, more aligned, great, more greatly aligned with his heart. Uh, Noel used to say when he would come, he would say, and I think I'll get the words pretty, pretty accurately. He used to say, divine seriousness is the grand master key uh, to making spiritual progress in, in God. That's what we need right now, divine seriousness uh, for the hour. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let me uh, turn to my Medicare moment and talk, share about my uh, trip to the hospital. <laughs> but there is some, a lot of significance, I believe, that God wants to share. Uh, for, you know, for several months before... Uh, I had been really very lethargic. I mean, I just couldn't, I had no energy, and I mean, just everything was a chore. Walking, we, Donna and I were going to walk, and she could tell you this, but it was, a, it was really hard walking. I mean, the whole idea of trying to cut the grass or anything, which I don't really like cutting the grass anyway, but, but cutting the grass and all that was hard. And so, it, you know, it was like something was, I knew something was not right. And so it was either the day I went to the hospital or the day before, I, I cried out and I, I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, something is not right. Show me what this is so I can get it corrected. And so uh, that day, that afternoon, uh, I actually ended up going to the emergency room and then on to the hospital. Uh, and so this was on Friday, the 1st of November of this year. Uh, and this is, a, this is an important point. I had been working all day that Friday, working on writing the bride, bride book that I'm working on. I, th I think you all know that I'm rewriting the, the book about the bride. And so I spent all day pretty much working on it. And this was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I, had, I had just finished. I just pushed save on the computer and was uh, getting ready to get up and take the rest of the day off. Uh, and I began, at that moment, uh, began to have just pains in my shoulder, my left shoulder, and going down my arm, and all. it's just like, I mean, I wasn't doing anything physical, so I didn't say, yeah, this doesn't seem right. Um, but I had just finished that writing for that day. Now, this is important. The chapter that I was writing was, Is Every Believer the Bride? which kind of goes along, not kind of, does go along with Doug's, Doug's dream. Is every believer the bride? And I didn't make the connection initially, but after that I realized if we're going to be the bride, part of the eternal bride, now every, this is my theology on it, every believer is a part of the, as a betrothed bride for Christ. But the eternal bride, the eternal wife of the Lamb, will be the one who makes their herself, himself, ready. And so my theology is that not every believer will be the bride. And I list in that chapter, I wrote like seven reasons from Scripture that support that uh, premise. But that's not for today. But the point was, as I look back on it, the Lord was saying, if you want to be a part of the bridal company, your heart has to be aligned with the bridegroom. It's not about 
uh, a lot of the external things, although that's part of it, it's, it's our heart. And it's more than a heart who seeks after God. That's part of it. But it's a heart that is aligned with God, beats in rhythm with his heart beat. So I'm hoping that you're being challenged by this. I know I was, and I am still. That we need, every one of us, I believe it's for every one of us, we need to, and we'll talk about this more in a minute as well, we need to cry out, Lord, align my heart to you, with yours. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means and, and a lot more in the next message about it. So anyway, I was just finished up on the writing that, is every believer the bride? Uh, I started having these pains, and at first I thought, okay, they'll go away, you know, whatever it is. And so I took my blood pressure, and it was a little bit high. And so Donna and I decided, well, let's just go to urgent care just to make sure it's not a heart attack. And so they were going to get an EKG and all that. So they did an EKG, and I was really surprised. The urgent care doctor said, there's something irregular in your heartbeat or whatever. I'm going to send you by ambulance. I was like, wow, ambulance. Uh, down to the emergency room. And so we, I went by ambulance down to the emergency room. They didn't have the siren on, thankfully, but, uh, yeah, so, but we did go down there. And then so uh, they continued to do a bunch of tests and all that type of thing. And um, mainly they, they ruled out that I'd had a heart attack, thankfully, so that was good. They ruled that out. Uh, but they said that I had AFib, uh, arterial, uh, arterial fibrillation. Okay, can't even sp pronounce it. So how could I have it if I can't even know what it's called? Uh, so anyway, um, they said this is what you've got. And so th this is an important point. They sent, they, the main reason I stayed in the hospital was I didn't know how long I'd had it because I'd been really tired for several months, really. And I guess evidently, if you have that, then it, if, it, after, if it builds up for a while, there's a chance of blood clots that can go and give you a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. Uh, so they put me on this blood thinner uh, for, through IV for like uh, three days or whatever, two days, whatever is in there. And that's always fun to be hooked to an IV where, you know, the, the bathroom was about over here to that speaker over there and you're hooked to a cord, you know, <laughs> you have to, so anyway, probably TMI, but anyway, uh, so uh, then they, uh, and then they, at the end, they put, uh, they prescribed a medication for me, some stuff like that and go to see the doctor and all that. But the point, here's the point I want to, the reason I'm sharing that is they dealt with the past, and then they dealt with the future. Uh, the past through the blood thinner, uh, you know, blood thinner stuff, they dealt with the past to make sure that whatever I might have had in the past was cleared up. But then the medicine and seeing the doctor was dealing with it in the future. Uh, and that's the, this is the point when we start talking about aligning our heart with the bridegroom. To do that, we've got to deal with the past and we have to deal with the future. Uh, and so next week I want to talk definitely about the past and maybe both, but we'll see how it goes. And here, here's the picture the Lord gave me for that. He said, this, this is, uh, you know, this week afterwards he was speaking to me all about all this. He said, "You're okay, Picture yourself in the wilderness, you know, the Hebrew nation. They had come out of Egypt, and they were headed to the promised land. Uh, and they, but they were in the wilderness. Picture yourself right there. And, you know, they got weary of eating manna. And they started thinking, oh, man, look at Egypt. Boy, back in Egypt, we had cucumbers all kind of food, and we had, you know, they, they, they longed, listen to this now, they longed for the delicacies of Egypt. 
That was a phrase the Lord gave me. They long for the delicacies of Egypt. And then that was looking to the past. Looking to the future, they spied out the land, but said, no way, we're grasshoppers and they're giants in this land. They're too big, too mighty to take. So if our heart's going to be aligned, fully aligned with God, we can't look to the delicacies of Egypt and long for them, even though they were going to go back to Egypt. You know, they, were, they were just thinking about all that. But they long for those things. And whether they, did they want to take the promised land? You know, and we, if we here in the wilderness, we've got manna coming down every day. You know, we don't want to fight the giants, the issues that we have to overcome, essentially, the cities, the wall cities and all that, that we have to overcome in order to be that bride made ready. And that's what the Lord's saying when in our heart is aligned. Our heart, uh, an aligned heart with Christ will not look to the delicacies of Egypt in a longing way. And they will not be afraid or reluctant to take the land. And that, to be honest, that's where much of the church right now, we're right there in the middle. We, we've come out of, the, of Egypt. We've come out of the bondage of Egypt. But when we look back, you know, there's some pretty good things back there in Egypt. If we look forward, you're thinking, oh, man, I don't want to fight that giant. That guy's nine feet tall, and I feel like a grasshopper related to that guy. And we don't want to, we don't want to press on to that. But if our heart is fully aligned with Christ, if our heart is fully aligned with Christ, just like it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, Jesus hated lawlessness and he loved righteousness. And therefore, God anointed him above his companions with great joy. We have to hate what God hates. We have to love what God loves, and we have to pursue it. We have to, we have to leave the bondage of Egypt, not only leave them physically, but leave the longings of those delicacies of Egypt. And I, I really believe that if all of us were honest with ourselves, we would say, there's some of those delicacies of Egypt that I don't hate. I don't necessarily want to go back to it. But I don't really hate it. And the Lord's saying, he wants our hearts fully, fully aligned with his heart. To hate what he hates and to love what he loves and to pursue what he loves and to deny what he hates. Not only deny an action, but deny it in our, in our minds, in our hearts, in the desires, in our desires. Uh, and so this was, this was a, a real surprise to me when I began to hear this. Because, you know, I, I, my understanding up until I got this, all this revelation was we need a heart for God. But God wants to take it higher than that. It's a higher plane that he's looking for. And that higher plane is to not only have a heart for him. Because see, we can, we can have a heart for God and still be kind of pushing. I'll, uh, I'll walk over here a little bit. This is the, this is the world over here. We can say, let me get over here kind of close to the world. I have a heart for God. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, but I have a heart for it. 
how close can I get to that? You can have a heart for God and still kind of dabble in this or maybe not even dabble in it, but kind of desire in your mind, you know, that. Uh, so a line, heart aligned with God is going to hate these things in the world. And a heart aligned with God, see, we can have a heart for God and be content, in my example, in the wilderness, rather than pursuing the mountain. You know, Pastor Adon, who used to come, who came to our church a few times back in the 90s, I guess, give me this mountain. I guess it was Caleb that said that. Was it Caleb that said that? Yeah. Give me this mountain. In other words, I will fully want to take the land. I want to be the bride made ready because you got to overcome. You got to die to stuff so that Christ can fill us with glory. So we as a bride can be made ready. So there's a, there, a heart aligned with God, loves what he loves, and so and pursues what he wants us to pursue. So there's a twofold issue here. We can't long for the past, the evil aspects of the past, and we've got to radically commit to taking the land. That's the heart. That's the heart of the bridegroom. And he wants our heart fully, fully aligned with his heart. That's what God was showing me through this hospital uh, encounter. So I didn't share every detail about the hospital. Do you want to know any more about the hospital? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. Because AFib, I will say this. The function, the issue with AFib is that, this is the way they described it to me, is that the upper chamber, and I know we've got some nurses, and doctors, almost doctors in here, so maybe this is not really right, but the upper chamber they said that it does like this. Okay, what they did. It it moves. It does a lot of activity, but the, it doesn't impact the lower chamber. So, in other words, what it does is it's active, but it's not really accomplishing the purpose of the heart. And it could be that we a lot of us have some spiritual afib, a lot of activity but it's not really functioning like it needs to. And God wants to correct that so that it, the, the upper chamber, the heavenly chamber maybe, and the earthly chamber are in connection where it's functioning as it should. And that's what he wants to do with us spiritually uh, as well. Let me see if there's any more points I missed here. Yeah, one more thing I want to say about the hospital uh, stay. This is really interesting. I shared this when I shared the testimony a, week, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's really interesting, but there's a spiritual principle in it. Uh, there, we had we were getting ready. They said we could go home on Sunday afternoon, and this young nurse uh, came into the room, and he was uh, he said. I'd not seen him before the whole time we were there, and he comes bubbling in, and he says, hello, you know, kind of real happy kind of guy, uh, real nice guy. And he said, I'm here to, I've, I've came to disconnect all the stuff and everything, all the tubes and all that. And so we started talking, and somehow we found out he was a Christian, and he was part of, I, I'm, I don't think he knew too much about theology, but uh, he, he was said he was part of some uh, apostolic church, and, he, he, and we started talking about his career, and he said, yeah, I used to, I, I, I ministered, and uh, he did a lot of praying for people and healing and all that kind of stuff, and I was trying to ask the Lord what he wanted me to do, and he, that's when he led me into nursing, uh, because he had a, a platform for that, and so, we, you know, I knew he was kind of in a spirit-filled, faith-filled type denomination or church. And so I said, so you, uh, you move in the gift of healing? And uh, 
He said, yeah. Uh, so I said, well, just well, pray for me. And he was a little bit shocked, I think. He said, you want me to pray for you like right now? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I believe in healing, yeah. And so, so he prayed, and it was power. I mean, he had a powerful prayer, you know, faith-filled prayer, laid hands on me. And uh, so, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, Donna and I were wondering if he was really an angel or something. We hadn't seen him, you know. I mean, he didn't, like, vanish when he went through. He actually walked out. But so we weren't really sure. But anyway, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I don't really, I'm not, I'm taking this kind of thing a day at a time as to what God's doing. But, but when I did go back to the doctor 10 days later, the AFib was back in rhythm, whereas when I, the last EKG did, they did at the hospital, it was not. And his prayer was after that, before the visit. So we'll, who knows? But uh, anyway, the point, the spiritual point is he had he had faith and he called me to faith and for healing for healing and that's what we're going to have to have to go forward we've got to have the faith that that giant that's in our lives that we're going to have to fight to be a bride made ready that it's God that can do it God can do it uh and that leads me to the last point I want to make in the message is that, you know, we, we can't, having our heart fully aligned with God is, a, is above our ability to do it on our own. We cannot do it. You can try to, to get rid of that delicacy and eat manna all day long and think, I'm, I, I don't want that cucumber I do not want that cucumber I do not want it you know a hundred you confess it all day long and you're going to want that cucumber only God can change our desires only God can do it and only God can give us the faith to take the land we can't do it but we can uh, realize that this is what God is saying wake up to it the redemptive judgment we can cry out, God, I need, help me to not long for that delicacy of Egypt. Help me to realize the bondage of that. You know, they were, they were having to make pyramids and stuff, whatever they had to do. They had to, you know, make the bricks and do all that kind of stuff. Help me to detest the what, what you hate. Help me to believe that you can give me victory over those things I've struggled maybe, maybe even for years to overcome. Help me to do that. You can cry out. You know, Jesus said, seek, ask, and knock. We need to have that attitude of seeking, asking, and knocking. And at the same time, resisting. You know, Hebrews says, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding of blood. You know, we resist the thoughts that lead us to Egypt. We resist the unbelief that says we can't do it. We resist it while we're crying out for God to bring change and transformation. And as we do all these things, I believe that he will align our hearts with his heart. Align our hearts with the bridegroom. This one close scripture that's kind of popping into my mind, I'll just share it, but uh, hadn't planned on it. But uh, John, Gospel of John 1, 18, I think it is, said that Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. They're one in, at the heart, one at heart. And he's inviting us. He's inviting us into that heart relationship that he has with the Father. The bride will dwell in that heart relationship. And so we want to ask the Lord. Now, we won't do any ministry today, but we will do it maybe in the next week or two. 
do some ministry. We want to ask the Lord. I, want to, I just want to challenge you to ask the Lord to change your heart, align your heart with his heart, align your heart with the bridegroom. To put, put some inner prayer energy into this over the next week or two. And let's just see what God does. I believe he'll do some mighty things in us. Don't ignore my redemptive judgment of having to go to the hospital. Because it's not just for me, it's for you. And my prayer is that you can, re, you can uh, not have to go through a redemptive judgment on your own by heeding what God did in my uh, situation. So let's do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's just pray. We won't do any ministry today, but we'll, uh, we will uh, maybe in the next week or two. Father, we thank you that, I thank you for your heart, Lord. And Lord, I, I know, because everybody here has a heart for God. Our heart for you is to have our heart aligned with you. Fully aligned with you, with your heart. And so we say, Lord, do it. We can't. It's just beyond us. But we do ask, seek, and knock. Realizing that that's pr present tense ver verbs, which are continuous action. We continue and keep on asking, seeking, and knocking until you make it a reality. Help us to, help us, Lord, not to desire the delicacies of Egypt and help us to pursue the promised land, to give us this mountain, overcoming every stronghold, every city, every giant in the land, that we might be that bride made ready. Help us not to be content to live in the wilderness caught between these two worlds, we ask, Father, for a work of your Holy Spirit to be upon us. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Amen, all right, well, God bless you. End the service, yeah. Oh, we, uh, yeah, we end the, okay, let's end the online. Thank you, online people, for being a part of it, so. <laughs> all right, God bless, amen. Do you want to say anything, Brian? Yeah. Okay.